you know, I think I think one of one of my first memories of Arlene Alda is uh, of her in a beach hat with sandals. Um, how's, how's that for an opening line? Uh, actually, Alan, I don't remember. I don't remember what you were wearing, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, what, what I what I meant to say is uh, that that first I and um, and later uh, Lisa too uh, got to know Arlene, uh, her her husband Alan, and their three wonderful daughters um, in a very casual setting during December vacations uh, at a place uh, they would go and and my family has gone year after year starting many many decades ago uh, in these sorts of. Uh, you know, very relaxed, very family-oriented situations, uh, you often get to know someone's true self. Uh, and I have to say, Arlene was always one of the most genuine, welcoming, engaging, and interesting people around, uh, on or off the beach. Um, among other things, uh, she was the one who, on New Year's Eve, uh, organized the party and made sure that we all had fun. Um, I think Alan would help out a little bit, but it was always Arlene that was really the life of the party. She also always had something artistic going on. Uh, in her younger days before uh, we got to know her, she was a professional clarinetist playing in the Houston Symphony. She switched careers when her children were growing up and became a, an accomplished photographer and uh, author of, uh, of a number of books, many of them for children. Uh, I remember returning one year to our common December vacation spot this was after uh, her daughters had, had grown up, uh, and finding that Ar Arlene had taken up drawing. Uh, she was sketching everything, and I thought, wow, how many times had I told myself that I would learn how to draw someday, but never did, and, and here Arlene was doing it, and, and doing it really well. Uh, so it's not surprising to uh, hear uh, how her new book, Just Kids from the Bronx, came about. Uh, it's vintage Arlene. One day she happened to go back to her old neighborhood with a friend and got inspired to collect the stories of other people who had grown up in the Bronx, and she went out and did it. Uh, the evolution of the Bronx over the past century mirrors so much of the history uh, of America itself. It's a story, as Arlene notes in her introduction, of children of Jewish, Italian, and Irish immigrants giving way to the children of African-American, Puerto Rican, and Dominican newcomers. In the book, Arlene features uh, more than five dozen uh, Bronxites, or I don't know, Bronxers, or Bronxians, I'm <laughs> not quite sure what the term is. Um, some quite well known, like, like Colin Powell, Al Pacino, Carl Reiner, and Neil deGrasse Tyson, and, and others that um, I'm quite sure um, you, you've never heard of. Uh, some are older, others much younger. Uh, all the narratives are very much worth reading. Together, they constitute a fascinating collective biography of a place that we all, uh, even if we're not from the Bronx, can relate to because the memories are as much about the universal experience of childhood as they are about one of the great American neighborhoods. Uh, actually, it's really amazing how many people are from the Bronx or how many people know someone from the Bronx. Uh, when Lisa and I uh, first heard last year about just kids from the Bronx, we were very excited about it and eager to host an event at PNP for Arlene. Uh, and we just found out that, it, that tomorrow, right? Tomorrow is Arlene and, Al and Alan's 58th wedding anniversary. Um, and, and a couple of days ago was Arlene's birthday. So anyway, so ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Arlene Alda. was in the Caribbean or we keep it no, a secret. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> On the island of St. John, uh, Canil Bay, uh, those were great days and they and uh, we still know people who go there. We went for 30 years uh, and never met anyone from the Bronx there. <laughs> I'm, I am curious though because this is the first place I've been outside of New York since the book came out on March 3rd and been doing a lot of things in the New York area and television, radio. How many people here, by raising your hands, come from the Bronx? 
I knew it. Yes. <laughs> Great. How many people here know someone from the Bronx? <laughs> Amazing. The diaspora goes on. No, it's it's just great. Um, the reason I, I asked is something that Brad already touched on, that if you're from the Bronx, you will recognize some of the uh, specifics of what a person might say. And if you're not from the Bronx, you'll also recognize <laughs> some of the specifics of that child growing up. And I was most interested, basically, in the beginnings of, and the, where, where that person had the chance to become who they are and who, who they ultimately became. And when I went back to my neighborhood, it was with the CEO of J. Crew. His name is Mickey Drexler. And I hadn't known Mickey uh, but, you know, like a month before we went back. And he said, let's go back. And the reason we went back together is he grew up in my building. The building. And I never knew Mickey. Now, that either is... Uh, an, an anomaly or it's characteristic. I haven't figured it out. I thought I knew everyone in my building, it, it, but it's huge. The building is there now. It's, it has a name. It's called the Mayflower. And it, had, it has 96 apartments, if you can picture it, six stories, 96 apartments, a courtyard with uh, gardens, and an, uh, a twin building with another 96 apartments. So the, there were hundreds of kids in just that little complex of two buildings. And the neighborhood and the buildings were really a kid's life. Mickey also happens to be 11 years younger than I am. And when I was in high school, he was a little kid. So I, I would not have known him. But it was in that trip back that this book was really hatched because Mickey, who did not like his early childhood in the Bronx uh, and is very open about it, um, uh, Mickey started talking with such animation. And I was so interested because here was someone who had a title uh, he, he was up there in his field, but he also had a beginning that I knew nothing about. And there were a lot of people who come from the Bronx, came from the Bronx, come from the Bronx, who have achieved a great deal. And I, I didn't know anything about them either. So my curiosity really led me to wanting to know more about what happened behind the scenes, basically, when they were small? So there were a few friends uh, we have who are, are pretty well known, some not well known, but very accomplished in their fields. But uh, one of the people was, is, was Regis Philbin, who, who came from the Bronx. Um, I didn't know him then, but we ended up in the same apartment building in Manhattan, <laughs> on the same floor. So, so Regis is, of course, in the book, and uh, he was one of the first uh, people I talked to. Then there's someone called Martin Bregman, who produced uh, films such as Serpico, Dog Day Afternoon, The Seduction of Joe Tynan, Four Seasons, and um, Marty is someone I knew very well because our parents were good friends. So I interviewed Marty. And then I interviewed someone called uh, David Yarnell, who, who became a lawyer and a, uh, a, also a film pro a, a producer, film producer, document, documentary maker. And it was from those three plus Mickey uh, that I started to venture forth to other people like Colin Powell, who I did not know, who was very gracious in, in granting an interview, Colin Powell, Neil deGrasse Tyson, I knew a little bit. Uh, but the, getting back to the early interviews, 
they told very funny stories. So in their telling of funny stories, I, I, uh, I decided this, this is wonderful. I, everyone should know about these stories. And I didn't want to get into what a lot of people actually like to get into, which is a lot of nostalgia. This is really not a book of nostalgia, although in the course of it, as I said, you'll recognize some of the, uh, the stories as being nostalgic. But nostalgia always has that, that element of uh, wanting to go back, a wistful looking back. Very few people who I interviewed for the book, Avery Corman is, is brilliant in his interview. He, he can be nostalgic without being sentimental. And, uh, you know, he talks about the street games in, in a brilliant way. But I, I personally try to avoid that in, in, uh, in the interviews. But what came up was whatever came up. Um, so I thought I would give you a little taste of some of the, the things that started me on this path uh, a little bit. Martin Bregman, the, the producer uh, of Pacino's, oh, Pacino's in the book too. Uh, but it was Bregman's story that, that uh, kind of cracked me up because I knew him, but I didn't know him in this context. So uh, I arranged the book chronologically and Bregman, Martin Bregman was born in 1926. And the period of time that he's talking about is when he was a teenager at a, in about the early 40s, which was the beginning of World War II, just so you get a, a sense of what life was like then. He, <laughs> he describes, first he describes being in a clubhouse, not a clubhouse, a club room, in the building, in the apartment building. Can I? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Club room in the apartment building. And, uh, and what did the kids do in the club room in the apartment building? They smoked. These were teenagers, you know. They, all the nice boys I thought I met in the street, they were down in the, in the club room smoking. And he, 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 uh, he uh, Marty likes to, uh, to create the scene. So he said, hey, Sally, where are you? I can't see you. You know, the smoke is out. So at that same time, he then describes uh, his first serious date. At about that same age, I had my first serious date. She was Italian and I was Jewish. In those days, it wasn't so easy for an Italian girl to bring a Jewish boy to meet her parents. So she wasn't so sure about bringing me home. But finally, she brought me home for dinner. We were supposed to go to the movies afterwards. You know, I was dressed magnificently, a tie, a shirt, a jacket, I was fine. And during dinner, I was trying to be charming the mother took out a cigarette. She was looking for a match or something, and I, charmingly, reached into my front pocket and pulled out a pack. I was pure sophistication. <laughs> I'm talking, I'm fumbling with opening it without ever looking at the pack while the father looks at me. This is his daughter, Italian, pure. This is a mob guy, too, or at least he looked like one to me. As I'm, as I'm talking, I'm opening this packet of condoms. <laughs> in those days, everybody my age carried them, just in case. You never knew when lightning would come down and strike you and you'd get lucky. And I feel the stare as he's looking at me, her father, who looked like he was connected. The mother's looking at me. The girlfriend-to-be is looking at me. And I'm pulling out this condom. I wasn't looking, but I felt it. I was mortified. We didn't go to the movies that night. The girl got sick, and I got sicker. I never saw her again. 
<laughs> that was Marty Bregman. And then, <laughs> thank you. And uh, let's see. Oh, I love this uh, David Yarnell story. Uh, who also, he his, his birthday, actually, he's, today he's 84. Okay, so David Yarnell, da, 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 page 33. Okay. Um, he, he grew up, he had moved from the other borough with a B. He had moved from <laughs> Brooklyn to the Bronx and didn't like the Bronx at all. And in the course of uh, rethinking his, his beginnings and his time in the Bronx recently, he said, you know, it it's actually was a terrific place to be. So uh, he talks about uh, the fragrant smells from the bakeries and the, uh, the various uh, delis. And you know, he, he paints a picture. And s somehow or other, he decided that one summer when he was 16, the Bronx was just too quiet for him. And he lived near the Bronx Park. So he, he said, um, there was this Pelham Parkway gang near where I lived. These were the Bronx High School of Science and Stuyvesant High School overachievers. They were the smart Jewish kids studying to be professionals. Then there was the Tremont Avenue gang, tough street kids, knew how to hustle. They lived further south on the White Plains road line of the subway. I went back and forth between them. That summer, I was looking for something exciting and maybe even a bit dangerous. I had a cousin. He was a real daring, wild, great-looking guy. He was into jazz, dressing sharp, and smoking pot. Prompted by him and our friends in the Tremont Avenue gang, my friend Eugene and I decided that we would make some money by growing marijuana and then selling it. Now this is, th I'm talking 1940s, 1941. Who ever heard of such a thing? We staked out a plot of land 15 feet by 10 feet, about 300 feet inside Bronx Park, surrounded and isolated by bushes and trees. Bronx Park is a public park. We planted the seeds in early spring, and they were watered by nature and a nearby drinking fountain. We would dash to our crop as soon as we got home from school, thrilled to see that the plants were really growing. We weren't totally successful as farmers. One of three plants survived, but we harvested and starting the cure, started the curing process. The buds of the plants were placed in quart pickle jars, then placed under my bed, carefully relocated on Fridays, cleaning day, to avoid discovery by my mother. The courier for the pot was Max, a Brooklyn College student who drove a hack in the summer, a taxi service carrying New York City residents to the various Catskill Mountain hotels. I had met Max the previous year when he provided the service to my family on our annual trek to the mountains. His brother, a jazz trumpeter, opened the door to our customer base. These were the jazz musicians who were ready to improve their performance by smoking pot, weed, Mary Jane. All of this was a heady adventure that thrilled and scared the hell out of us. With the drop-off of our product to the Neverly Country Club in Klein's Hillside, <laughs> we had a profit of $270 for the both of us to split. That was a lot in those days. Not bad for a summer's work, but our adventure came with much more fear than I wanted. And when it was all over, I was much relieved. I went back to Christopher Columbus High School and hit the books. <laughs> that's, that's David. So it, what... What was really surprising to me was I thought all of these, you know, shenanigans that boys did came much later, you know, came, came with other generations, but there they were. And the fun thing is they were, I loved hearing them talk. 
because they were in a way enjoying the fact that they were kids who did these kind of nutty things and they survived and they went on to do better things than that. Uh, that was a big surprise to me. And also, I, I, this reminds me, the process, the writing process that I went through was one of interviewing uh, with a tape recorder, uh, transcribing from this rambling uh, conversation. I didn't, I didn't have regular questions uh, because I just wanted to see what would come up. I didn't want to limit anyone's uh, uh, narrative by posing questions that were my questions <laughs> preconceived. So we just talked. We just talked, and and out of the talking came these, uh, I think, wonderful stories. So then I would, after the transcript, I have something like 22, 18, 22 pages of, of rambling conversation. Well, that does not make a good book. <laughs> so um, the each task, uh, each story's task, my task, was to basically edit it to a cogent and coherent story and also to keep the words that the people themselves said. So there are voices in here that are very, very distinct. Um, and it, I found that to be very interesting and beautiful as I got into the younger people as well. Um, okay, so those, those were in the, in the uh, pre-war, war years, World War II, Jewish boys, the Bronx at that time, uh, each neighborhood was very distinct, but they, there were overlaps of ethnic groups. I think the Jews represented maybe over 60% in the borough at one time. Uh, the borough was, was increased in size by the subway system being built and going further north. Uh, and as the subway went north, developers developed uh, the Grand Concourse, which was uh, modeled after the Champs Elysees, and and went further north into uh, what ultimately became Parkland. Oh, that's another thing. The Bronx has 25 percent of the borough is Parkland. That's something that most of us don't realize because there is an urban feel to a, uh, sections of the Bronx. But as you go further north, further east, you get into Pelham Bay Park, you get to Orchard Beach, the Bronx Park, Van Cortlandt Park. These are acres and acres and acres of, of beautiful park land. Okay, so uh, the, the, okay, the Jewish boys, one more. I, I love Milton Glaser. He's a, a, the great graphic artist who uh, brilliantly thought of the logo, I Heart New York. And it was done during a, a really bad time in the city, I think probably in the 70s, uh, when the city was almost bankrupt. And um, great logo, it's used by everyone all over the world. And he gave it, he didn't, he didn't uh, copyright it, he just gave it. He thought this was something people should hang on to. So Milton Glaser, um, he, <laughs> his family, he describes with a twinkle in his eye, but I can identify a little bit with it because it sounds a little bit dysfunctional from <laughs> <laughs> from my point of view. So he's, he says, my mother never ate with the rest of the family. My father, who had this dry cleaning store, would come home from work at about a quarter after eight at night. My sister, who at that point was still in grade school, would come home early and have something to eat. Everybody ate by themselves. Every once in a while, two would eat at the same time but my mother was never seen eating. 
During the day, she was taking food from somewhere. It was very strange. My mother also cooked spaghetti in a very specific way. She would boil it for an hour until it had gotten gelatinous and lost its identity. She'd toss Velveeta cheese in before the water had boiled off. Then she would demold it from the pot because it had been reduced to a kind of pudding. It was like the Dome of St. Peter's. And after that, she'd slice it and fry it in chicken fat. In my teenage years, I went to an Italian restaurant for the first time. I asked for spaghetti. And when they brought me a plate of spaghetti, I said, no, no, I want spaghetti. <laughs> spaghetti. <laughs> it's Milton Glaser. And he then goes on to describe uh, a really wonderful um, event in his life that he said it was so important that it is almost too hard to describe from his subjective point of view. When he was five, a cousin came over to babysit. And Milton was five, and he, uh, the cousin came with a, paper, a brown paper bag. And um, he said to the young little boy, Milton, do you want to see a bird? And Milton said yes. He thought the, his cousin had a bird in the bag. And the cousin took a pencil out of the bag and drew a bird on this bag. And the way Milton describes it is extraordinary. I mean, you have to read it. But he's, he said it was an epiphany, that it was as if God had actually come down and struck him, he, he nearly fainted because he knew at that age, at that moment, that this was what he was going to do for the rest of his life. Amazing, I mean, I get chills when I think of it because, uh, and he, he also understands that this doesn't happen to everyone, that there are artists uh, who, who slowly come to what their calling is. And he ends his story by saying, um, art, art is something that possesses you. You don't, you don't possess art. It, it comes to you. And he said he's always lived his life in that way. And I certainly believe it. He, he's uh, very full of incredible ideas and great integrity. OK, so there's the artist, the, the two people in show business. And then there's. I love, uh, I was, uh, people usually ask me, well, how did you get the people for the book? Well, as I said, I had a few friends and uh, I asked them and they were kind enough to give interviews. But I was watching uh, television and an ad came on uh, for something called the Calvary Hospice hospital in the Bronx, and they showed a very kindly looking doctor uh, smiling at the camera, and he was actually embracing two of the patients. And the name came on, and it said, Dr. Michael Brescher, uh, executive director of Calvary Hospital. Well, I went to school with a, with a Michael Brescher, who was not a doctor. He was a street kid, and he was a, a nuisance. <laughs> but I called up, sent emails, and finally connected with the hospital, and it was the same Michael Brescia. So I went down, uh, we got together, actually met at a great section uh, in the Bronx called Arthur Avenue, which is the Little Italy of the Bronx. So M Michael and I had a, a nice lunch, and he described uh, a lot of his experiences and how he became a doctor. Uh, as I said, he was a street kid and he describes himself as someone who the teachers at PS 76 wanted to get rid of. <laughs> so they were very happy when he graduated and went to Evander Childs High School. So, okay. So Michael gets to Evander Childs High School and they, 
the first thing he knows, he has to do an IQ test. And he does the IQ test, and this is what happened. I was challenged by this teacher, Mrs. Lou Bell. She looked at my IQ test scores and said they were definitely not my scores. <laughs> she wanted to know where I sat. Well, I sat next to my friend Menasha, who was smart. Mrs. Lubell was sure that my test was not on the up and up because she only knew me as a pain in the neck. She thought that I cheated, that those high scores weren't really mine, so I had to retake the IQ test. And I suddenly found myself removed to another classroom, which was far more challenging. And Mrs. Lubell was my new homeroom teacher. That was a bridge for my group of kids who I hung out with who were totally unmotivated to this other group who were mo motivated educationally. So I figured that I could sit in the class with the advanced kids that still have a leather coat, a ducktail haircut, and have lunch and hang out with the other guys. I would do their book reports in the cafeteria during lunch. <laughs> They'd get in line and say, tell me, uh, get in line, and I'd say, tell me what the book was about. Like, tell me what the basic story was. And they'd say, well, it's about this guy, and he got shot, and blah, 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 blah. So I would construct a page of stuff, having never read the book. And the guys I did it for, they very much respected me, because I helped them out. That meant I got respect in the street, and I also got girlfriends. When you grew up in that neighborhood, as far as future was concerned, you were either going to take numbers, be a loan shark, be an athlete, or do some menial job. Uh, and uh, he grew up, he got scholarships to, uh, I think it was Fordham, went to medical school, and, and uh, not only became a, an outstanding caring doctor, but one who invented something that's used to this day. Uh, it's a fistula for kidney dialysis. Uh, it bears his name as one of the uh, two I think it's the uh, Chimino uh, Brescia fistula. And this was a kid who, uh, who was bound to be nowhere if not for a teacher and another teacher. And it was funny because Mickey's father, who, was, uh, who had come from Italy, was also worried about his boy and the future of his boy. And he was sure that if if Michael, Mickey, Brescia would only become a plumber, that he would have his life set. Like, look at Nick the plumber. He has a car, he has a wife, he has kids, and he has, you know, he has a home. That's the thing you should be. So <laughs> at the end of the story, uh, Brescia describes how happy the family was that he graduated. Uh, medical school and they threw him a big party and he was the first one I think who went to college in his family and the party uh, ended up with most of his uncles saying to their children M Michael's Mickey's cousins um, look if Mickey could do it you <laughs> could do it too <laughs> Uh, so that's a case, it's interesting. This theme kept coming up, the theme of teachers, how important the, the teachers are and were, continue to be. Teachers, mentors, neighbors, anyone who cared. And in most, throughout most of the times, even in the worst times in the South Bronx, you had neighbors and teachers and family that cared. A lot of us who were not in the Bronx in the 70s and 80s, and that was the South Bronx mostly, when things were terrible, when the Bronx was burning, if you saw the movie Fort Apache, that was, it wasn't an exaggeration, but it didn't give the total picture because it was one particular section in the Bronx. There are many sections in this borough, uh, and if you look at a map, the borough actually looks like a kimono that's kind of dancing. It has, you know, 
little arms sticking out there. It's actually interesting. Um, but anyway, the, the, I, I would love to, uh, to punctuate the, the teacher aspect of it all. There, there are a couple of stories. One is of a little Puerto Rican boy named Luis Ubinas, who grew, he was born in the late 1960s. Uh, his father had, was, as he described it, was enlisted as a kid by drug dealers. And this, his father, that the kid, who was, who was then a kid, had no chance. He became a uh, drug addict. He married and died in his 30s. So this mother was left with uh, the support of three or four of her own kids, of their kids. And Luis was, I think, the oldest. So the mother worked in a sweatshop, basically, sewing clothing for, for little kids for very little money. And when she had enough money for housing, there wasn't enough money for gas, electric, phone. So they were constantly being dispossessed, thrown out. So you can imagine the lack of stability in this home. But there was a grandmother who lived in the projects. And every time the, the family came on hard times, they always knew they could go to grandma. But what does this do to a kid's schooling? Every time he had an address and went to a school, he was then displaced. And if the school sent out notices like your child qualifies for the gifted program in PS whatever, uh, they never got those notices. So he ended up in a, again, this was the 80s or the 70s, in a very dysfunctional school system. and. Uh, he was very smart. He, again, scored very high on tests. So they didn't know what to do with this kid in the school. So they skipped him one grade, two grades, three. He's little. He's nine. He's in sixth grade at this point. Sixth grade, a bilingual class, and he, he spoke Spanish fluently. But there were kids in that class who were 12 and 13 kids who were left back, who were not bilingual at all. I mean, it was such a mishmash. Well, one of the teachers there recognized the gifts, the intellectual gifts of this little boy, and without parental permission, took him by the hand, went into the subway, took him to Manhattan, uh, had him interview, excuse me, at three different private schools in Manhattan. Uh, he got into all of them, and they gave him full scholarships, and it was up to him to decide. And the teacher said to him, okay, Luis, which one do you want to go to? And he said, the one where the boys wore jackets and the teachers stopped the kids who were running in the hallway. And he ended up at a school called Allen Stevenson, then went on to Cathedral High School, Harvard University, Harvard Business School, successful businessman who then took a job running the Ford Foundation, <laughs> which he just uh, uh, left recently. But I just love that full circle of, of events that this poor, poor boy was saved by a teacher, and he had no money, and he ends up giving out millions of dollars from, you know, it's just, I just loved it. But he, Luis has an incredible lyrical way of talking. And I'll just give you a sample of how he describes part of his childhood, because I could not have said the words that he eloquently says without any problem. So let's see, Luis, uh, okay. Um, I'll just read a little bit of, of his. 
Okay. The thing about growing up really poor is that there aren't many carefree days. You don't have enough days in a row without knowing whether or not there's going to be enough food. You don't have a day when it's winter and it's snowing without knowing whether or not there's going to be heat the next day. It's not just the moment of not having that's challenging. It's knowing that the moment of not having will either continue or return. I think what's shocking is the permanence of the conditions of insufficiency we had of never having enough, or even when we did have enough, knowing that not having enough would soon return. Can't, you can't make this up. It, it is so from his soul. And uh, I must say, when I spoke with him by the end of his interview, and he's a very cheerful guy, I was like devastated. It was, it was so, how this child survived. Well, my heart went out to the many kids who did not survive. But the, the point I'm trying to make is throughout all the chaos, there were always people who cared that, that rescued the kids. And they're, they're out there now, you know, and the schools fortunately are much, much better. Um, okay, so that's Luis Ubinas. Um, let's see. Sure, sure, sorry. I could go on forever. <laughs> there are 64 people in the book. Um, anyone, questions, anything? Sure. Did all the people you interviewed end up in the book? And did you uh, start writing the book before you had everybody lined up that you wanted to interview? I'll answer the first, the second first. Oh, I forgot, microphone. In the Bronx, we shouted. <laughs> um, when I was, uh, when I interviewed the first few people, I, I knew that, where is the, oh, there you are, okay, I knew this material was beautiful, it was honest, it was truthful, uh, it was, from my point of view, unusual, um, and I just wanted to explore it more. I didn't have, my regular agent was someone, or is someone, who usually handles my children's books, so I, she was not the right person for this project, so I had to find another agent who would be interested uh, so that was another another little obstacle. But I knew that this had to be a book. It had to be. And and once I had committed myself to uh, to the very well known names like uh, Regis Philbin and Colin Powell and Neil deGrasse Tyson and Mary Higgins Clark, I. I felt responsible to them. I didn't want to let them down because they openly talked to me and gave me their stories. So I thought their stories were, were their lives and I was entrusted with that little portion of what they said. So I knew it would be a book so somehow or other. It took me over four years to pull it all together. Um, most, it started in a very random fashion because these were friends and a lot of my friends are similar age groups give or take 10 11 years and I wanted to branch out so um, it was a question of how do I reach other people and once I started networking um, it things just fell into place and then what I saw was a kind of I envisioned that this was a kind of a kaleidoscope with changing pieces that, that were always the same colors but different configurations. And then recently, um, I, I was interviewed in, in New York at Hunter College, and the person, uh, Lenore Segezi, who who interviewed me, said to her it was like um, an architectural dig 
where you uncover something. And I thought, that's a good image. I like that image. Because I found a little shard of something that I knew had had a connection to another little shard. And it was down in the earth. I, that whole image just appealed to me. Um, I had asked a number of people uh, who declined being in the book for, for various and very good reasons. Um, for instance, Sonia Sotomayor is, I, I, uh, you know, I'm a big admirer of hers, but she had just come out with her own book, uh, and uh, it might have been a conflict of interest in, on many levels. Uh, but basically, everyone who I talked to, with the exception of one person, ended up in the book. Yeah, thank you. Um, just this afternoon, is this on? Just this afternoon, I was listening to This American Life, and they did um, a, a whole hour on one story. Uh, Hannah Jaffe Walt picked the poorest congressional district in the country, and it was in the Bronx. Yes. Which was really surprising to me. Yes. And her story was about some children who succeeded uh, from the kinds of poverty that you described, but others, others were, were not so successful because yes. they felt the big gap between where they were and where they could be. So, so my question is, are there any stories in your book about uh, kids from the Bronx who, didn't, who were not successful and who regret okay. not taking different paths? It's an excellent question. The thrust of my whole book was to interview people who were successful. Mm -hmm. So I did not interview others. Maybe that's volume two. Mm -hmm. But um, I was really curious to see how how people of different generations mm -hmm. kind of made their way through whether it was a ghetto or, you know, not everyone in the Bronx, even, uh, even now, is poor. But the borough itself is the poorest. And it's a heartbreaking statistic. Um, and just to add uh, in along those lines, all my proceeds are going to organizations that benefit children living in the Bronx now because the need is tremendous. Um, thank you. And, and there are great organizations, uh, both schools and, and social service and after school programs. So there, there is a lot that's happening. And the Bronx, there's, I think, a, you know, this gets into a political arena, but I think the Bronx Borough President, uh, Ruben Diaz, is, is trying to do a really good job. Uh, he's also in the book. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes. Yeah. If someone interviewed you for your book, what story would you tell? Okay. Um, if you're interested, I, I my uh, story is in the book, but I wrote it. <laughs> I was interviewing myself. I could give you a little, a little bit of. Do we have time? Yeah. Okay. I guess I could have been interviewed, but I declined <laughs> in, my, in my mind. Okay, so I was born, also I'm of the older generation. I was born in 1933. So, okay, uh, Arlene Alda, where am I? 61. I can't see with these glasses, back to the other glasses. Um, I, just to let you know, I'm one of uh, three children. Um, I'm the youngest of, of the three. And we lived in, a, in a, that wonderful apartment building, the Mayflower. Um, I, you know, everyone in the book sent in a, a, a vintage picture of themselves. So I sent in, you, you'll see it in the book, a picture of myself with my dog. My dog, Spotty. So uh, this is just to set the scene. We lived in a one-bedroom, one-bathroom apartment, mother, father, older sister, older brother, the mutt, fox, terrier, Spotty, and me. We ate our meals, played cards and board games, did homework, and told jokes in a small area adjacent to the kitchen called the dinette. 
Uh, and the dinette became a, a focal point of family activity. And in this dinette, there was tucked away in the corner, and this was not a big room, maybe it was six by eight or I, I can't I, I'm very bad at dimensions, especially transposing my my memory into you know what would it, what was it? So let's say it was six feet by eight feet or seven feet by nine feet. In the corner was a sewing machine, and my mother was a very skilled uh, dressmaker. Um, so that was in the dinette. The word singer stood out in bright golden letters across its black background. My mother was a skilled dressmaker who designed and sewed her own clothing and also earned money by sewing dresses for others. What was a skill and an asset for her was sometimes a curse for me. Why is that machine so noisy? Why does she sew her own clothes into all hours of the night? Why does she have to make my clothes? Why can't I buy them ready-made like Diana down the hall? My feelings would erupt, and the targets were my mother and her machine. Stop sewing. She'd try to placate me in a few minutes. Stop now, I can't think. No answer except the rebuke from the incessant drone of the motor with the needle moving up and down, up and down, up and down. My mother hates confrontation. She ignores me. I storm out of the dinette crying. I slam the door to the one bedroom in the, in the apartment. It wasn't just that I was most probably a spoiled brat, wanting what I wanted when I wanted it and often getting it. I was also hopelessly stuck, falling over and over again into the same muddy emotional rut as I watched my mother sitting, hunched over sewing while she sang or hummed under her breath. My knowing how she spent endless days and nights working as a housewife, cooking, cleaning, shopping, washing, clothing her kids, and being on call for whoever became such a clear message to me not to end up like her. And then it goes on. She had the immigrant dream, which is why I'm here. Um, okay, another oh, I, question. I apologize. I didn't realize to come to the mic. Um, as a New Yorker myself, did you find that as you were interviewing, and you have such a beautiful variety of individuals in the book, that there was such a pride that people just wanted to tell their stories and one led to another and, oh, I have a friend who also wants to talk. I mean, did you have more people than you could possibly put in the book? Um, I could have gone on quite a bit. Yes, there was definitely a pride, which led to actually to the title because these, all of the wonderful people in the book did not forget where they came from. And they are still those kids, in this case, from the Bronx. You know, so yes, a tremendous pride. Whether it's in, you know, it, it focuses on various things. It could be the school cheer, or it could be, you know, the Yankees, the, you know, we're winners. Uh, it could be any number of things, but a tremendous pride. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I grew up next door to you in Yonkers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the same building. Um, but we were, I, I think we were always very conscious of the Bronx. We may have played some of the kids in football, I don't know. But, and I've always had the last decades thoughts that once people made it a little bit better, they moved out of the Bronx and they came up to Yonkers. So I was wondering if in your book or in that didn't get in the book, did anybody ever talk about moving up to Yonkers or, or what? <laughs> Not specifically Yonkers, but there was definitely a thrust to get out of the Bronx because for a number of reasons. Manhattan was Mecca to most of us of a certain age. And it was close. And the idea was to better yourself and get a good job in Manhattan or to live in Manhattan where the cultural activities or the uh, business activities, whatever it was, that was a tremendous magnet. But the Bronx in many ways was more tranquil 
not later on. And uh, now it's 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 okay. It's not it's economically not okay. But people living in the Bronx now. Um, the kids I interviewed, kids, the younger people in their 20s now, uh, do not want to leave the Bronx. The Bronx is home. They feel secure. It's affordable. It's not like Brooklyn, which is not affordable. It's not like Manhattan, which mm -hmm. is not affordable. So uh, not specifically Yonkers, but Westchester, which Yonkers is part of, is a destination. Mm -hmm. And Long Island and New Jersey were destinations, absolutely. Mm. But I didn't know anyone who said Yonkers specifically. <laughs> but I did, I did have this. <laughs> we have a, a kind of a, a crazy friend. He's not crazy, but um, for, the, for the purposes of the story, he, uh, he was a young married man. And the realtor took him to Riverdale, which is the upscale section of the Bronx, furthest west, and it borders Yonkers at this mm -hmm. northernmost border. And uh, he found a great apartment, and he loved it, and he moved in. And then he found out that Riverdale was part of the Bronx. He thought he was moving to Westchester. <laughs> he moved. He, he, he left moved. Riverdale, yeah, Riverdale because he didn't want to have a Bronx address at that point. Go figure. It's when I say Yonkers, they say, I didn't know you were from New York. <laughs> but otherwise, <laughs> they don't get it. <laughs> but thank you. Hi. Hello. Um, just to bring things up a little bit to the present time. Yes. Uh, there was a very, very nice article in the New York Times about a month ago uh, about how you met your husband and the role of uh, rum cake yes. that <laughs> fell on the floor, I think. And uh, there was a line in that article that um, I'm wondering what you, if you agree with that said, in general, they do not seem to act like they're in their 80s. Well, it's, you know, the preconceived notion of what is what is 80, what is 50. You know, Gloria Steinem, you know, when she was 50, I think she said, this is what 50 looks like. You know, you don't look 50, but this is 50, you know. So I think, you know, we're just very fortunate that we're, uh, we have health. That's a big factor. And that we have a background of creating our own paths. It's not as if uh, we're in a business where you have to retire at a certain point, and maybe it's downhill from there. I don't know. But it's a good question. The preconceived notion is that once you reach a certain age, whatever that age is, that you stop living, and I don't know what retirement is. I, I, you know, I can't imagine not waking up in the morning and doing you know, what I do. So... Is that is that the thrust of your yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. I, I just thought that that sentence was very incongruous in in in, the, in that story, um, and um, so I think this is now would be your twentieth book. It's or my nineteenth. This is and my nineteenth. Do you have another one in mind? <laughs> uh, have notes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very very much. Thank you. Hi, Arlene. Thank you. Hi. Okay. I read the first part of the book uh, last night. It's wonderful. And what stuck in my mind was how many times there was this phone that people shared in the apartment building or one phone in the candy store. And whoever picked up the phone, and that was a joy, that was a great responsibility, yeah. had to go find whoever was being called. Yes. And they either had to run up the block and maybe run up some stairs or shout up some stairs to an yeah. apartment building if they were coming from the candy store or shout up from the apartment building they were in. And given how much technology we have and that these people had to share a phone and it was the excitement of the moment, could you speak to that a little bit? Kids, everyone grows up with whatever it is they're born into. You take it for granted. Uh, we didn't have a phone. I didn't think we were deprived by not having a phone. No one I knew had a phone. That was before the war. After the war, 
there were, you know, phones available. I don't remember exactly what the details were. You couldn't, phones, I don't know why you couldn't get a private phone, but they were not available. The lines, the numbers, whatever it was. So whatever it was in terms of the kid, it was in this case, it was Lauren Saper who told the story of waiting by the phone in the candy store so that he could pick it up and run, become the runner to the person who was asked for, and it could be a block away and five stories up, in order to get that nickel tip. You know, money was very precious, so kids were very enterprising. I mean, there were uh, kids. By the way, the storekeepers employed kids. Kids were employable, or maybe the, the, the rules were ignored, whatever it was. It was after the child labor laws, I know, but <laughs> somehow or other kids were, were working. Uh, but any, any penny meant a lot. And the phone uh, situation was just one of the many things you took for granted until you had your own phone. And then you said, like my mother used to wash her clothing, the family's clothing in this one bedroom apartment by hand in, in the bathroom sink or in the bathtub, I don't, don't quite remember. And it was hung up to dry in that bathroom or outdoors. Where do you go outdoors if you live in an apartment building? The rooftop. Tar Beach, so there were clothing lines, you know, up on the, the rooftop. Didn't think anything of it until washing machines came in and said, my God, this is incredible. That was one of my jobs in the family, go down to the basement and bring the laundry and wait till it uh, was finished and then put it in the dryer and watch it spin. <laughs> what, what I just want to say, what I liked about that was that the people had to work together, and this was a sheer work ethic. For a nickel, yeah. you could go to a movie yeah. and stay maybe six hours or yeah. get that milkshake. And so it was, you know, work, then treats. Yeah. Well, Different. that's true. And, and money was valued. It was not taken for granted. You know, I, I say I'm not nostalgic. In that case, I'm a little nostalgic. I, I do wish that there were a sense of the value of things and how, how fortunate all our kids, or not all, a lot of our kids are, who have uh, the clothing, the roofs over their heads, the extra spending money, um, you know, all the gadgets that they seem to come up with. Yeah. You didn't do, you didn't get, right? Yeah. That's exactly right. If you didn't do, you didn't get. Okay, anyone? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Great audience.